Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. Now, what are companion videos? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. You see, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we save the second half of the show to take live questions. However, we don't always have enough time to get through all the live questions that get sent in, but if you sent in one of those questions, I want to make sure they get answered properly in a video, so I gather up those unused questions, and we address them right here on companion videos. So without wasting any time, let's dive right into it and start getting caught up. And we're going to start getting caught up with NR99, who writes... Do you think Charlie Sheen can have a resurgence just like Robert Downey Jr. did uh, with his career? If so, what do you think he has to do to get there? Uh, then he follows up also with, also, did you ever watch Two and a Half Men? The show ended a while ago with major black backlash and never got on track once Charlie left. All right, thanks for sending that in, man. Charlie Sheen. I, I mean, I don't know what to say about Charlie Sheen. Now, of course... You know, it was well documented, you know, how everything went south with uh, Two and a Half Men. It was a very successful, long running show. He left and then they uh, it did they replace him with Ashton Kutcher or something like that. Anyway, they killed off his character and I think they tried to replace him with Ashton Kutcher. By that time, it was already too little too late and the show kind of went out with a little bit of a whimper. And now John Cryer is Lex Luthor somehow, some way. But at, at any rate, do I think... Charlie Sheen can ever have that kind of a comeback that like Robert Downey Jr. did. I'm not going to say I hope he doesn't. It, uh, not that at all, but I don't think he can. Now, there's two big differences, I think, between the scenarios with Robert Downey Jr. and with Charlie Sheen. The one big difference is that, you know, Robert Downey Jr. was already an Academy Award nominated actor. He was already acknowledged in the business as a top-tier actor. Charlie Sheen, and don't get, hey, listen, I was a fan of Sheen at one point or another as well, but he was never considered that level of talent that, say, like a Robert Downey Jr. is. And that's no insult. Very few people are. But Robert Downey Jr. was already considered top-level talent. He was already an Academy Award nominee, all that kind of stuff. So he had that kind of a background to help his resurgence, if you will. The second thing, and this is completely... I don't know. This is pure speculation on my part because I don't really know. But, you know, Robert Downey Jr. fell out of grace for doing some really stupid things. Charlie Sheen kind of fell out of grace by appearing really stupid. Do you know what I mean? And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Charlie Sheen is stupid. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying with Robert Downey Jr., he did a number of stupid, idiotic things. And I think we, as, the, as, a, as a movie audience, as a television audience, we tend to be more forgiving for that long term. With Charlie Sheen, it wasn't a matter of doing stupid things, is that he started to appear kind of stupid and kind of losing his mind a little bit. Again, I'm not saying he did. I'm saying the appearances were, right? Like that was kind of the, the appearance of it. And I don't know if there's coming back from that. Like the fact that he didn't have the background that Robert Downey Jr. has to propel and help a resurgence. You know, Charlie Sheen was never an Academy Award nominated actor. Um, and on top of that, the, the I guess you could say the circumstances of their falls was a little bit different. So I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I'd see it happening. And, and also to help Robert Downey Jr., not his background, but having the type of talent he has means he's still quite valuable to filmmakers because he brings that level of talent. And I don't think Charlie Sheen does. Charlie Sheen has a very unique celebrity set of skills that made him great in the things that he did, but I don't know if it positions him for a big kind of comeback. But, you know, listen, I know the guy still has his fan. Like, if we look up... Hold on a second. Um, all right. If we look up uh, Charlie Sheen here, and, I mean, let, let's take... Let me bring this up here. Um, like, take a look at this. The dude still has like 11 million followers on Twitter. Like, it's not like he just up and disappeared and fell off the face of the earth. He still has like 11 million followers on Twitter. So he'll always be a celebrity, right? He'll always be a celebrity in one form, shape or another. That's for sure. But can he have a resurgence in the Hollywood scene? Uh, I got to tell you, I, I have my doubts. I, I have my doubts that that'll be the case. But who knows? You never know. Crazier things have happened in this business. All right. 
Next up, uh, Yash Rashput writes, John, from midnight today, India, a country of 1.3 billion people, I've, I heard about this, is under a complete lockdown for three weeks because of the COVID-19. Hashtag stay at home, hashtag stay safe. And listen, it's the best thing that you can do. The best thing you can do when an outbreak like that starts going is everybody just seal themselves off. Not just to keep yourself healthy, but you keep yourself out of the equation as being a transmitter. So not only are you keeping yourself healthy, more importantly, you're not becoming a transmitter being out there transmitting it around. So, hey, hang tight, hang in there. We will all get through this. We'll come out on the other side and get this BS behind us and, and then we'll move on. But all of our best to you, Yash, for that. All right, 50 Shades of Geek writes, I love Christian's guest appearance last week. Christian popped on as he does once in a while to give us some movie recommendations as we are all, are all under a uh, kind of quarantine here. Uh, I'd love to see more crossover between you two. He and I would both love to, but it's just, it's a matter of time. It really is. It's just a matter of time and schedule. And we really don't have a lot of each. So we're kind of happy doing these little like segment crossovers for now. Uh, maybe an open mic since he doesn't do SCN live on Saturday. No, but but now you're asking him to work on his day off, right? When he's supposed to be spending time with his family and his kids and all that kind of stuff. And so, no, I don't, I, I'd never ask him to take a Saturday just because I'm an idiot and I work on the weekends. Doesn't mean I would ever ask somebody else to do that as well. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath for that. Uh, also, next time you see him, tell him he doesn't know shit. Trust me, he'll get the joke. I oh, don't worry about it. I tell him that all the time. I tell him that all the time. Uh, all right, next up, uh, Termite30 writes, Hey guys, I would like to recommend The Dragon Prince on Netflix. I know some think animation is for kids. I don't think that at all. I think there is a lot of animation that is for kids, but there's a lot of animation for everybody. Anyway, but this particular series can be easily enjoyed by kids and adults alike. I'm curious as to what some of your favorite animated series are. Well, some of my favorite animated series, I mean, if you want to go back, I love Space Battleship Yamato, also known as Star Blazers. That was one of my all-time favorites. Obviously, I love the original run of the Transformers, the G1 stuff. Like, lately, I'm a huge fan of Archer. I love Archer. Some seasons are better than others, but I generally love Archer. Uh, I like Good Family Guy. I'm in love with the Harley Quinn series. So there's a bunch there. But let me bring this up here quick. Let me see here. What's it called? Uh, the Dragon Prince. The Dragon Prince, which I'm not familiar with. Let's see here. Dragon Prince, it's a Netflix uh, series. It's got a 97%. It says, in the magic land of uh, Zadia, uh, magic comes from six primal sources, the sun, moon, star, sky, earth, and ocean. When human mages create a seventh kind of magic, dark magic, they start capturing and harvesting the unique magical creatures uh, they need as ingredients, which sparks a war in Zandia. Okay. You know what? Sounds kind of neat to me. I've never even heard of it, but now you've put it on my radar. I might have to check it out. Thank you so much for the recommendation, Termite. I really appreciate that. And listen, I just noticed as well, you put in a $50 super chat. Thank you so much for that because on the rare occasion that somebody tips that much, I like to honor that by not only answering the question here on the show, but then I also answer it in its own standalone video later and put it up on the YouTube channel. Check back later this week or maybe in about two weeks to see your question answered. And maybe by then I'll actually have had a chance to look up, uh, maybe watch an episode or two of this show. I'll try my best because it does look kind of neat. It's a newer show. It's from 2018. It's listed as a comedy, which is kind of interesting. So I will check it out. Thank you for the recommendation, Termite. And thank you for supporting the channel on that level, man. We appreciate that around here. All right. Next up. And, and thank you for putting that on everybody's radar. All right. Alex Good writes, hey there, guys. Love the show. Question for Rob, who is not here. Uh, what do you think of the Harley Quinn story, Mad Love? Uh, read the novelization recently, and I loved it. I, unfor I have not seen it. And unfortunately, Rob is not here to answer the question. So I will kind of side answer it a little bit. I am so big on Harley Quinn right now because of that damn animated series. The Birds of Prey movie, not so good. But that Harley Quinn animated series, I'll tell you what, I wasn't going to watch it because I'm not big on DC or Marvel animated stuff, to be honest. But then I had so many of you guys tell me, John, I think you're really going to like this. You're really going to like this. And I kept having tons of you guys tell me that. So I'm finally like, fine, I'll check it out just so I can say I tried it. And within five minutes of the Harley Quinn show, I was sold. I was completely sold on it. I, I completely love and adore it. So at some point, maybe I'll have to check that one out myself as well, Alex. All right. Mason B writes, 
Uh, Asian Jim, by far, is my favorite thing from The Office. Asian Jim, played by actor uh, Randall Park, who just recently was in that Ali Wong Netflix movie, Always Be My Maybe, with uh, Keanu Reeves. Totally delightful comedy, by the way. I I just enjoyed that movie very, very much. Uh, he was, of course, in Ant-Man. He was, of course, or at least Ant-Man 2. He was in Ant-Man 2. So he's in the MCU. And I think I heard he might be reprising his role maybe in WandaVision. I'm trying to remember, but I, I believe I heard that he's going to reprise his Ant-Man role somewhere else in the MCU as well. I love him. Then, of course, he was in uh, Fresh Off the Boat. He is the holder of the funniest line I've heard in television in the last five years. I'm not saying Fresh Off the Boat was my fav- favorite show, but there was a line, because Anne loved watching that show. There was a line in that show, spoken right by Randall Park. So to set the situation, Randall Park uh, owns a restaurant, right? And one of his employees comes up to him, and I'm totally not going to do it justice, just so you know, but one of his employees comes up to Randall Park and says, Hey boss, I was wondering if I might take a, a, a little vacation. If I may, if I can take some vacation time, and Randall Park puts his hand on his shoulder. He goes, "But Bob, if his name is Bob, Bob, work is a vacation from poverty." And I don't know why, I just about fell out of my chair. I was laughing so hard, and I had a hard time breathing. I was laughing so hard. Um, the line, just the way Randall Park delivered it. But yeah, Asian Jim, Randall Park is a treasure, is an absolute treasure. All right, anyway, uh, uh, Aisha G writes, Hey, John, wanted to submit my movie recommendation. It seems as though every time you hear the name Heath Ledger and the word dark and the word night, it's associated with the dark night. However, I saw him in 2001's A Knight's Tale. It's one of my favorites, and I like A Knight's Tale. And as a matter of fact, it's not just Heath Ledger. Alan Tudyk is great in that. Paul Bettany, Vision himself. Paul Bettany, to me, was the standout in that movie. Uh, he was absolutely the standout in that movie as the, as the not the squire, as the, uh, uh, the guy who would read the poetry, the entrance guy, the hype man, if you will. That was the movie that made me a big fan of Paul Bettany. And I started following him after that movie. And now, of course, he is who he is, which is really great. And I'm forgetting her name. Um, Sosima... Anyway, the female lead of the movie, I think the character's name is Jocelyn or something. Anyway, and the actress's name is something Sosima or something like that. Anyway, she went on to be in, she was a recurring character in um, the Headless Horseman show that was just on TV and I'm forgetting the name of the show. Anyway, oh my God. She was like one of the most beautiful, be- male or female, out of any men or women in movies, she was like one of the most beautiful physical creatures you could possibly see, especially in that movie. And she's still gorgeous. I had a chance to interview her. Uh, she came into our studio maybe about three years ago, and I had a chance to sit down and interview her. I'm like, whoo, because she's just, she's so stunningly beautiful. To this day, she's amazing. Anyway, it's a really nice little film. I enjoy it. A little cheesy. It's not like one of my favorites, but it is certainly enjoyable, and Heath Ledger was very good in it. All right, next up, Ryan writes, as punishment for not watching The Office, because of course, uh, Rob mentioned today on the 15th anniversary of The Office, Rob has never seen an episode of The Office. Uh, as punishment for not watching The Office, Rob should have to watch the episode Scott's Tots once a day for the next week. Quite possibly the most uncomfortable episode in the show's long history of uncomfortable and cringeworthy moments. And for those of you who have not seen The Office, Ryan means that in the best way, because he's not wrong. I almost have to, I have to physically get up and walk out of the room sometimes in Scott's tots. It's brilliant, but it makes you, and they do this on purpose. It makes you so uncomfortable. It makes you so uncomfortable. Um, it's just, oh my God, it is so brilliant. And that kind of speaks a lot to their shows, but you're right. I, you know, Robert was saying earlier today that I should curate like my 10 favorite episodes and then sit down and we'll live stream. Uh, him watching those episodes with me. And you know Scott's Tots will be one of those. Scott's Tots would absolutely be one of those. So we'll have to keep our eye open for that. All right. Uh, Next up, uh, Miko Swayan writes, Hey, John, imagine if Warner Brothers releases Wonder Woman 84 on VOD. Theaters Union will explode in anger. Heads will roll. Well, I mean, yeah, obviously. They obviously would. But more importantly, 
Warner Brothers would be committing financial suicide because, you know, a, a Wonder Woman in theaters could possibly make a billion dollars. A Wonder Woman on VOD at most caps out at maybe 300 million. Maybe, maybe. The producer of the film, Charles Roven, he came out and he made the statement. It would be absolute. He uses the word ludicrous. He goes, it would be absolutely ludicrous for us to go that way absolutely ludicrous they would lose so much money it's it's unbelievable you know there's this myth out there there's this belief out there no matter how many times we talk on this show and we show the facts and we show the statistics and we show the numbers and how many of the film industry professionals keep saying it over and over again that there's really not a lot of money to be made in vod at all we keep showing it over and over again. There still tends to be this belief amongst film fans that, oh, if movies came out on VOD first, they would make lots of money. No, they wouldn't. Every bit of data shows that they wouldn't. And, you know, studios, here's the thing I keep saying too, you've got to have faith in the studio's greed. Have faith in studio's greed because studio's greed means they will do whatever it is they think will make them money. And if they thought for one hot second with all of their experts and analysis and research and studies and all the millions of dollars they put into that, if they thought for one second that putting their movies out on VOD and just skipping the theatrical exhibition would actually make them money, they would do it. Trust in their greed. Trust their greed. There's few things in this world you can count on like the greed of corporations. And if they thought that for one second, if they thought there was any data to support that notion, they would do it. They would do it. And they don't do it. And that's why. And and the, you know, the Warner Brothers executives talking about the Wonder Woman situation specifically said it would be absolutely ludicrous on their mind. But yes, you are right. The theaters would would go, I mean, they, their heads would just explode. Their heads would just purely explode, Michael. You're absolutely right about that. They would just completely lose their minds. All right. DJ Titus writes, uh, my recommendation is Enemy Mine, one of my faves. I've always enjoyed that one. I saw that one when I was quite young. Um, Lou Gossett Jr. as the alien in that. Mm, it's a great movie. One I recommend from time to time. That's a good recommendation. G.J. Titus also writes, if you like war movies, I recommend Uncommon Valor. That is another really good one, as a matter of fact. That's two good recommendations, DJ. Well done. All right. Uh, Cass Graphics writes, my movie recommendation as we are on lockdown is Brotherhood of the Wolf. Brotherhood of the Wolf is a nice little movie, actually. It came out in like the early 2000s. But here's one of the interesting things about it. One of the stars of the film is, oh, and I'm like, DeCoscos? Mark DeCoscos? Is that his name? I think it's Mark DeCoscos. I could be wrong about that. Anyway, if you don't recognize his name, that's fine. But you would recognize him. He is also the chairman of Iron Chef. In the words of my uncle, he's the Iron Chef. He's, he's, he's the chairman of the Iron Chef. If you ever watched Iron Chef, like I watched Iron Chef, he's the chairman of the Iron Chef. Now, he's also been in other things. Most recently, he was in John Wick Chapter 3. He's the guy John Wick has the big final fight with, uh, which is always cool to see. Anyway, he's in Brotherhood. And if I remember right, the crazy, he's Asian. I think he was playing like a Native American in that movie, which is a little bit crazy. But anyway, it's a French film. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, so the basics of it is this. If I remember it right, like, so the king, there's there's a bunch, of, like over 100 peasants have been murdered by a beast, right? So he sends off these two guys to go and investigate it. And it all goes from there. So anyway, that's a nice recommendation too, Cass. I like that. All right. Um, Gazarama writes, I just wanted to know, John, about your intermission music. Oh, there you go. Uh, you use every day. Was it written for the show? Thanks. No. As a matter of fact, it was not written for the show. That is music that I bought the license to. So uh, I, I found that music. I really liked it. It kind of suits what I like. So I went ahead and I purchased the license to the music so that I can play it on my shows and stuff like that. So no, I did not compose it for the show. I did not perform it myself. I did not have a commission. I actually found the music and then I purchased the license for it. So that's how I've got that. Uh, all right. Matthew Melagranu writes, I think Universal did the right thing. I mean, you're allowed to have that opinion, but did they? I mean, this is probably going to cost them dearly long term. This is going to cost them dearly. Like the movie theater industry has never said, we won't forget this. 
You know, we have always been there for you. We have always supported your movies. You wanted to take X amount of money from the movie tickets. All right. We may not have liked it, but we went along with it. You wanted to shorten the theatrical window to three months. All right. We may not like it, but we'll go along with it. You want to have your, you know, make sure your movies get on the right amount of screens. Fine. We're there for you. We, we support your movies. We'll put your advertisements up in our movies. We'll play your trailers. We'll put your standing billboards in the hallways of our theaters. We'll do all the things that you want done to help promote your movie. We'll do. As somebody who worked at AMC, for a while I can tell you the movie theaters bend over backwards to try to support the studios and their movies as they should because it's a it's a symbiotic partnership right so they should bend over backwards to support the studios and they do and now the stu now when the theaters need the support of their partners the most the studios all the other studios are doing their part and Universal did this and that's fine that's their right they are going to lose a lot of money by doing it to VOD, but they were going to lose a lot of money regardless because this movie, the tracking on it before the coronavirus stuff showed that this movie was going to flop. It was going to drop more than half from the opening of the first Trolls movie. So it was the, this movie was in trouble anyway. But by doing this, the movie theater industry is going to make Universal pay. And that's something you... Look, with every decision that you make in life, there are going to be consequences, Right? Some consequences are small, so we make the decision that has small consequences. And Universal made a decision for their movie, great. But I hope they took into account the consequences that would follow. Because by screwing over your partner, by screwing over when they need you, and you screw them over, that's going to come back to bite you in the ass. And it's not just going to be for the next six months. It's going to be for the next, I think, four or five years. I believe Universal is going to find themselves having a very difficult time with theatrical exhibition and getting the, the theaters that they want and getting the screens that they want and getting the number of screens that they want and getting the percentages that they want. They're going to have a very difficult time because I believe the movie theater owners are going to go, hey, when we needed you, you turned your back on us. You gave us the middle finger. So now that you want something from us, oh, it's a shame. We don't have enough room for your movie in our theaters right now. Oh, it's a shame. You want to be on the, the IMAX screen in our theater? So, you know, higher ticket prices? Oh, sorry, it's booked. You know, they're going to... And it's not going to be anything that makes the news. This is what we were talking about earlier today. It's not going to be anything that makes the news. It's going to be these little behind the, this behind the scenes thing. And it's never going to be one big thing. Like, it's not going to be theaters refuse to show Fast and the Furious 9, right? It's not going to be anything like that. It's going to be these little things. It's going to be in the small details of the the distribution contracts for each one of their movies coming out for the next couple of years. And it's going to be death by a thousand cuts. And yeah, because the movie theaters are not going to forget that when they... And just like you... Imagine if you had a business partner, right? And you have a great relationship with your business partner. And you've always been there for your partner when they needed you. You've always been there for them. And then some kind of hardship comes along that affects your business overall, and you need to rely on your partner. And when you needed to rely on your partner, your partner turned their back on you. How are you going to react when times are good again? It's going to be different. So Universal did the right thing. Show me one business professional that agrees with that. I, I, I just don't see how this is. This is going to cost them more long term than any short term temporary benefit they got from doing this this is going to cost them a lot more long term so it'll be interesting to see how this all un unravels all right jonah writes i wouldn't say every aspect of spider-man 3 is bad there's actually great chunks of that film i like mostly in the first half the amazing spider-man 2 was just boring well i mean listen i think every bad movie has some redeeming qualities like there's very very few movies like i can't think of any redeeming qualities of catwoman i can't well Halle Berry in that outfit. Okay, maybe there's a little bit of that. But um, Highlander 2, no redeeming qualities. Battlefield Earth, no redeeming qualities. There's very, very few, though, that are like that. Like, even I, you know I don't like the prequels, but I can sit here and I can have a conversation about the things in the prequels that I actually quite appreciate and that I like. And, well, Spider-Man 3 is probably the worst Spider-Man movie Um. I would absolutely say it had its redeeming qualities. It absolutely did. 
Thomas Hayden Church as Sandman, I thought was actually really quite good, a quite interesting character. You know, outside of the emo Peter, there's also some really good stuff in there from time. I mean, again, not a movie that's very good overall, but it has its its moments. Amazing Spider-Man 2, I also think that, you know. I think there's some great action sequences. I thought the Gwen Stacy stuff was really good. I thought the Gwen Stacy death scene was powerful. You know, it, it has its upsides too. So I agree with you, Joan. I think that these are both movies to me that have some upside. All right. Uh, and last thing of the day, this was the last thing that came in before the sh- we ran out of time on the show. There are a few other questions still, but those questions were all submitted after the show was done. So those are meant for tomorrow's show. But uh, Michelle Alexandria just sent in a $5 super chat just to be supportive. Thank you so much for that, Michelle. I really appreciate it. And all right, guys. That'll do it. We are now all caught up for this little installment of the companion video. Thank you so much to all you guys who sent in those questions. And you know, I want to make sure when you send them in and you support the channel, they get answered properly in a video. So thank you for sending those. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. Number two, you supported the channel while you were doing it. And all of us here on the John Campio YouTube channel, thank you very much for that, guys. All right, guys, don't forget the John Campia Show returns tomorrow morning with me and Robert Meyer Burnett. We've already got a number of things we're going to be talking about tomorrow, so please make sure you join us for that. That'll do it for me for now, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye.